<laughs> Hi. Welcome to Videoville Church. Now, you may not know me if you are seeing this for the first time or hearing those words Vidivo or connected with the word church, Vidivo Church, but my name is Michael James Stone. Some people call me Mike Stone like when I was growing up and that's fine. But at some point in time, I got saved. I was a born again, Jesus people person, saved in 1974. And through the years, I've become a preacher. Now, some people would say pastor, but since I don't grow you up like sheep or bring you to a place of a relationship with Jesus and make sure that you maintain that relationship, I don't consider myself a pastor in the true sense of the biblical Jewish way of looking at what a pastor does or a shepherd of the sheep. But when it became obvious that given the amount of information that I do know about the Bible and my personal relationship with Jesus, it was pretty clear that I was destined for and had always been in the ministry since the moment I got saved. And that's been over 40 years. So at a certain point in time, God took me out of being in the supportive ministry, meaning helping others in their ministry, to actually doing what God wanted me to do in promoting, relating, talking about, sharing, discussing, discipling, all the other religious terms if you want to use them, um, about a relationship with Jesus. Because I discovered that sometimes some of the missing links aren't about the chain of evolution, but the reality of the people that are involved in the body of Christ that we say are part of the big universal church, a part of something that is greater than we are, bigger than we are, and really we can't even see how it all works together. But God can. And by his Holy Spirit, he's able to maintain all the parts thereof. It's kind of like, I don't really think about how my foot works, but it works. I don't think about how my finger works, but when it's not working, it's pretty obvious that I'm complaining. Obviously, there are things about my body that work autonomously or are controlled by parts of my brain and parts of how I've been designed that take care of themselves, sort of. They work cooperatively together in a way that I don't have to think about or pay much attention to. And that's the way it is when it comes to God's big picture, when it comes to the, as we say in the religious terms, universal church. Well, Vidivo is just simply video devotionals. I was called into the ministry in order to inspire people and to conspire certain digital technical venues to which I could help you to be reminded of who you are, what you are, where you come from, where you're going, and what God wants to do with you, put it bluntly. And so I'm not here to save you. That's between you and God, but I am here to remind you that you can be saved. Because to put it bluntly, there is a heaven and there's a hell. And, you know, it's kind of like, well, you can deny it, but it doesn't mean that it goes away. It's just one of those things that you can go learn about. You can go discuss with God about. You can figure it out. It's not that hard. It doesn't take rocket science to figure out the reality of the, how do we say it? Um, let's think of a word we can call religion without it being so offensive to you. But the reality of a relationship that you don't believe in God until God actually reveals himself to you. And I'm fine with that. I don't have a problem with that. Matter of fact, that's the way I got saved. <laughs> I would not be a Christian if God wasn't real and hadn't presented himself in reality to me. Yes, I've heard God speak directly to me and it's not some voice in my head, though at times God does speak as a voice in my head, a still small voice, a, a voice that after the storms of life, after the crashing in of circumstances that have devastated me or wiped me out, then God comes and kind of says, hey, I'm here. It's okay. I'm with you. Whew. Glad I don't have to figure that one out on my own. But no, God has spoken directly to me also. And 
because of that, he can't take that away. I mean, that's just one of those things that when he does, you'll never be the same. Just like when you get saved in reality, not some, you know, mega concert that you went to or some crusade, you know, that you 10,000 people went forward, you know, and sure enough, the next year, the same 10,000 went forward. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the reality of you in the dark of the night, in the cool, calm, quiet day after the summer has been hot. And you're hurting inside or you're desperate for some kind of relief because you're in pain. Or maybe you've had a breakup in a relationship that you thought was the one and only. Boy, could I tell you stories about one and onlys. How many times do you have to have a one and only? But the bottom line is nobody has ever had it right since Adam and Eve. Adam blew it, and from that moment on, we need help in order to understand God. God never said that we would understand him. He said, you won't. So every time you get religious people like, you know, theologians or somebody, you know, standing up and telling you about God and to do this and do that. Well, you know, I mean, you can listen to them. You can think about it. You can pray about it. You can decide to do it, you know, and if it helps you, good. You know, I mean, bottom line is you may not have to, but if it works for you, do it. But it might not work. And so that's not God's fault. That's just the reality of people trying to get closer to God and God said, you won't understand, but you can try. And so he did send his son in order for us to understand him better. And Jesus flat out said, look, you, you don't even know what you're doing. So I'm not going to tell you not to do it, meaning that I'm not going to abolish the law. I'm going to fulfill it. But I'm going to tell you there's a better way. Paul said it this way. There's a more excellent way. I like to say, well, it's not good news. It's great news. Because <laughs> if I had to figure it out. Holy cow, would I make a, a strict, structured, organized religion that would make everybody do everything perfectly. And they wouldn't be able to because nobody's perfect. I mean, we're all sinners. I mean, we all screw up, you know. And bottom line is, you know, it's not an excuse. It's just what we live in. My body's not perfect. Though my wife might think so. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> Maybe your body's perfect. Hey, you know, you've been an atlas or, you know, you've been working out and you're like, oh, cool, you know, or you got the latest tan, you know, kind of like I just got back from the being on the Mississippi River for 126 days, you know, I'm traveling from the headwaters to the Gulf waters. So I picked up a tan along the way, <laughs> a couple other things too. Oh, you know, but I'm recovering. I'm getting over it. Um, but the point of it being is that whether you understand it or not, and excuse me for burping, but, you know, whether you understand it or not. Churches, religion, and all of these things have a certain amount of benefit to you that if you use it and don't abuse it, it can work for you. If you don't want to, that's fine. Didivo Church specifically is an internet-based church. Um, we were Utah's only all-outdoor church, and we recorded a lot of messages and videos that are outdoors only. So. If you see sometimes, you know, Vidivo Church being called Utah's only all outdoor church, we're not Mormon, you know, I'm a Jesus freak. But uh, specifically, we are a internet church, meaning simply that, well, you're looking at a video and that's a Vidivo because it's a devotional. It's meant to share my faith and my things I've seen and heard and handled with my own hands, as the Bible says, about Jesus. And so that's why Vidivo Church exists, to remind you. I'm not going to tell you anything. Well, some of you, it'll come off as something new, but for most of you, it's just, you know, kind of like, hey, get a kick in the head, dude. You know what I mean? Come on, straighten up. You don't have to be so perfect that you're no earthly good or so righteous that you're no heavenly good. Because to put it bluntly, there are none righteous. <laughs> no, not one. <laughs> God said he even looked for one. He said, ah, hey, where are they? None. So unless you can measure up to the standard of Jesus, you better stick with grace and mercy. Because 
You're not going to make it to heaven unless you have grace and mercy. You know, the mercy is what God does. The grace is what God did. See, the mercy is something where God says, I know you can't make it, so I'm going to forgive you anyways. Just ask me. You know, what am I asking for again? Because he knows we're stupid. And to put it bluntly, people are stupid. I mean, that's what it boils down to. We think we're smart, but turn around and you, you know, any, any theologian that you want me to talk to, I'll talk to him and I'll say, look, first of all, let's get the basic premise down. God said, you can't understand me, so don't even try. So, I mean, that's the bottom line. So most theology is based upon the study of God, not the reality of the revelation of God, where God reveals himself. And he's already done that through Jesus, but that's what most times things get messed up when it comes to religion. But Coming back to the point of what we're doing this video specifically today about is I just got back from the Mississippi River. I'm pretty tired. I'm pretty burned out. I'm pretty, well, beat up. I can't even, if I raise this arm, I can only go so high because I have what's called shoulder impingement. That means I have to get, you know, like shots and I have to exercise my shoulders and get all the other muscles healthy to carry the load because my weakened muscles can't handle the pain of just everyday life. And that's what the problem is with you. You have an impingement in your life. You have something that's holding you back from accomplishing what God wants for you. See, God isn't like some big religious God up there saying, well, I want you to be perfect and I want you to go kill that person and do this, that, and the other thing, you know, and make my people, you know, become whatever. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I get what you're, what you're trying to say out of the Old Testament, but no. The reality of what God has said is that, hey, here's my son. Look, I know you keep trying to figure me out and you want me to have a name. Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahshua, you, um, on and on and on. We get all these names, you know, we play with the name game, you know, Nana, Nana, Bonana, Fee, Fi, Fofana, Nana. God said, I don't, you know, I know what you're trying to do here. You know, you're trying to kind of like you know, understand me through a name and you can't. So God didn't give us YHVH, the yud heh vav -Hey, you know, to be his name. No, he said, I am that I am. I, I, I exist. You know, you're, you, you, I'm your creator. I'm your father. And that's where we suddenly come into when Jesus revealed God. He didn't say God. He said, my father who is in heaven. My father is like this. This is my father. Now, he did warn the religious leaders, your father, you don't even know who he is. Ooh. Ooh. Who's my father? Well, I personally, you know, I'm going to say this a little bit, and some people are going to get offended, maybe, or they'll laugh. But I'm a bastard. <laughs> and I don't mean because my wife says so. <laughs> no, she never calls me a bastard. But no, I was born out of wedlock, you know. Um, spiritually, that works for me, you know, because frankly, you know, I mean, being born again, I kind of, you know, new creation, old things passed away, all things become new. Um, but no, my mother, you know, didn't marry my father. I mean, she was just kind of messing around and I happened to be born a bastard. So there's the facts. So bottom line is, you know, I'm someone who's been changed from what I was to what I am to what I'm becoming. And Jesus was telling the religious leaders of their day, you're all bastards. <laughs> so if you see somebody, you know, like up in a pulpit that thinks he's perfect, you can think of what Jesus said and just don't get too serious about it. You know, don't go up and tell them that they're a bastard. They won't like it because God warned us about calling each other that. You can call yourself that, but, you know. but spiritually you are because you see, you're meant to be children of the most high God. You're meant to be sons and daughters of God. You're meant to be adopted into the family of God, to become like Jesus, bottom line. And so Jesus came and he talked about his father and he warned about people that weren't of God, that weren't adopted, that weren't of the same spirit that he is, the Holy Spirit. Now, I know, you know, when I say Holy Spirit, you're going to go, oh, no, yeah, you know, yuck. Well, I agree with you. A lot of people that, you know, mess around with the spirit of God, deal with this Holy Spirit, and then they get into presence and feelings, you know, and feelings, nothing more than feelings. Ah, I got peace, I got joy, I go, no you don't. I mean, 
if you're telling everybody you got peace, love, and joy, frankly, I don't think so. I mean, peace, love, and joy is obvious. It's not something told. I mean, it sort of looks like a Joel Osteen moment, you know, and I'm not opposed to Joel Osteen. I think he's a nice kid that got stuck in a tough situation that probably doesn't know as much as people want to assume he knows. You know, and there's a lot of things that he says is probably, yeah, you know, I mean, in the right venue is right. And, you know, he kind of messes up some things, but don't we all? So, you know, I'm not a Joel Osteen fan, but I'm not against Joel Osteen. It's just he's needed for what those people need. You know, God will take him wherever he needs to go. Schuler was another one. You know, Schuler was nice. You know what I mean? Built a nice, you know, big glass cathedral. It's no longer there. You know, Chuck, Chuck was pretty good on Bible studies, but guess what? People aren't following what Chuck said. You know, I mean, a lot of things are like, hey, everyone has a personal accountability to God, a personal responsibility to God. I personally deal with God every day. I definitely know how much of a sinner I am. That's why I'm more humble to myself alone with God than I am when, you know, people look at me on video, you know, like, ah, look at that guy, you know. He's prideful. Really? Seriously? <laughs> really? Come talk to me. <laughs> we'll figure that one out. But getting back to the nature of man, the reality of Vidivo Church and where we are today, if you look at the world, people are pretty much doing their own thing. They're kind of coming up with their own ideas about politics. I mean, just look at the elections. Football, you know, we're going to bend a knee. We're going to do the Copernic, or are we going to do the TiVo? Well, neither one, you know, because both are just kind of like, you know, their own personal idea of what they say now with the cameras watching, what they do. I want to know what you do in the dark of the night when you're crying out for help. What do you do when you're throwing up from, you know, that party last night, hanging on to John for dear life and just, you know, vomiting? Well, that's where your faith is. That's what faith is about. Who do you call upon when you're in trouble? Mom, bail me out. Dad, send me some money. You know, <laughs> bail bondsman. I'll put up this, that, and the other thing. You know, and skip down. <laughs> Don't do that. But what is true is what you do, not what you say. Now, there's a certain amount of getting saved that involves you know opening your mouth and saying something you know god honors a certain amount of your words and actually if you open your mouth too much he'll bring back to you some of the things you say it, what comes around goes around you know the old kind of like playing that game kiss but you reap what you sow you know those are all true <laughs> so for a person like me i gotta i'm looking at the camera to watch my mouth i have to watch my mouth <laughs> because literally God holds me accountable for every idle word. Idle word? You mean every every word? Yep. But you see, on the one hand, that's a bad thing. On the other hand, that's a good thing. Because see, the bad thing is, yes, every idle word, so that means you're guilty because you're, you gossip. That is, in America today, I'm trying to find people that don't gossip. I mean... When you define the reality of what gossip is, everybody gossips now. I mean, we have come a long ways downhill when it comes to really knowing what words are, what they mean. But everybody gossips now. I mean, really, they do. I mean, if you're not talking one-to-one -to, -one to the person, you're talking about someone else that's not present, you're gossiping, <laughs> really. Gossip doesn't have to be all negative. It can be you know, other things, too. So, bottom line is everybody's guilty. Now, that's the bad thing. Now, the good thing is because you're guilty... You want more grace. Where sin abounds, where you gossip too much, grace much more abounds. So it's like, got it covered. Well, not really. You got it covered because of Jesus, but not because you are anything special. You're smart enough to have gone, oops, I am guilty. And that's about all we have to figure out in this life. We got to figure out we're not so good that we deserve heaven. Or that we're not so wonderful that we love everybody i'd love to tell you that you know all christians love everyone but you know there there's like the gay community now or the whatever you want to call it the transgender community i mean pretty soon 
you know, we've gone from, from a certain amount of words to define people's actions, good or bad. What comes up after transgender? Transhumanism? I mean, that's what some people think that they're out there, you know, lizard people and snake people and all kinds of things from sci-fi. And just because we can come up with things that look like Egypt, you know, like people with, you know, like uh, snake heads and stuff like that, because, I mean, some people graph things and make things and look like it, you know, because of tattoos or whatever. But, and not just tattoos, but, you know, I mean, they do some graphic, you know, kind of like refigurations of their skin and their, their bone structures, you know. But the bottom line is, who cares? It's not about your body. Your body's gone. I mean, somebody that, you know, no offense to people that are transgender, but when you get to heaven, you're going to be transgendered. Yes, I mean, I don't mean the transgender people. I mean you as a, let's let's pick somebody who, Billy Graham. Billy Graham's getting transgendered. Yeah, really. He's going to heaven where he's neither male nor female. Think about it. Be careful. I got you. So, what's up with the transgender? Well, you know, I, you know, I don't recommend that as being something pleasing to God, but... Bottom line is you can use the word and, you know, kind of come up with your own spiritual reality of, yeah, we're all going to be transgendered eventually, neither male nor female. Because, frankly, at, at creation, God looked at man and said, look, man don't look so good all alone, so let's just take a rib and make a woman. You know, so on bottom line, if you clear it all up and get rid of all the extra accoutrements, woman, ah, woo-hoo, you know, well, yeah, I mean, that's... That's what God did, you know, so fashioned with his own hands. He did it. He did this. I made a woman. <laughs> I know you don't think of it that way, but that's okay. You'll figure it out. So, in all of the situations that you think are so holy, I want to make holiness what it really means, not something that's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. um, um, um. Um, no, holiness is completeness, that's all, just what you're supposed to be. So, when I got done with the Mississippi River adventure, journey, videos, books, you know, I'm writing a book, you know, called How Not to Kayak the Mississippi River, about the Mississippi River trip, and then also Mississippi River Preacher and a bunch of other things that are coming out, but I wanted to clarify that you know, I just got back, and that, no, this Sunday, I probably, well, this Sunday, I might, you know, have a, we might have a service, you know, going, you know, who knows, but Vidivo is never going away, I mean, I can't stop talking, <laughs> my wife, she gets a lot of sleep when I start talking, I start talking, she goes to sleep, but Vidivo will always be here, just so you know, Video Church will always be posting. I mean, we'll always be there with the videos, you know, and there'll always be that with which God has called me to do. Preach. Preach just simply means reach out with the word. It just means present information. It means to give all this stuff that came into my head, my heart, my thought life, my, my spiritual life, and just kind of like vomit it out. I mean, on camera. <laughs> but um, to present it to you in such a way that, you know, you have to deal with it. I don't. I mean, I, all I'm required to do is to say what God has said. After that, I'm not accountable for anybody's soul or spirit or, or blood. Ezekiel was warned, look, if you don't open your mouth and warn them, I'm, I'm coming after you, dude. And so Ezekiel said, really? Seriously? That's not fair. But he went out and warned them anyways. The bottom line is that, though a lot of people have seen my videos before, so they're used to my moving my hands, moving my head, bouncing around, you know, coming off four walls. I want to tell them and then tell new people that I'm going through changes, changes in my life. I'm leaving all the emptiness behind. I try really hard each day to shed a little light, to keep each moment of my life both clear and bright. Believing in the feeling, yeah, I got saved by feelings, that I know is right. And the reason why I feel so good is because I'm doing what I want to and it's part of me. 
Keep it close to Jesus. Oh yeah, that's the way it's got to be. Knowing that this feeling will flow eternally. And all I am is all I have to be because I am going through changes. And that's a song from Love Song, a contemporary Christian music artist group that was probably the forerunner of a lot of Christian rock, although most days today we would call it probably sounding more country western or folksy than Christian rock, but it was. Tommy Coombs and, you know, Chuck Gerard and Fred Field, I think, and I can't remember the other guy. But um, anyways, the four of them, you know, they, they recorded that song, you know. A lot of things that were, I would say, sung and said and a lot of lyrics were so right on that sometimes maybe the people didn't keep up with what they were saying, but boy, did the words fit. And so for me, yes, I've come back changed by being on the river, but also filled by being broken and just wiped out by the river. The um, Mississippi River isn't the river of life. It's one of the seven rivers that God created in the beginning. It wasn't called the Mississippi, by the way. <laughs> There's a interesting um, reality about our world that since Noah, since the flood, you don't see creation the way God intended it to be. Since the curse, you don't see creation the way God intended it to be. If you looked at a rose bush and you saw thorns, those are undeveloped blooms of roses. So if you could picture a rose bush with a million blooms, that's the way God made it at the beginning. So when he made the garden and Adam and Eve were in it, you have no idea what it was like. I mean, it was so lush and wonderful. And there was no real oceans. There was no real, you know, giant seas. It was contained either within the wellsprings under the earth or in the mantle of the earth as there was a firmament of water around the earth to protect the earth from the radiation that was coming through that causes us to age and to get old. So the reality was that, you know, Adam and Eve would have lived a long time. I mean, like forever. So physically meaning, not just spiritually. But um, when... Finally, God cursed the earth, kind of baptized it. He did a makeover that was unbelievable. He didn't start off saying he was going to do a makeover. He said he was going to wipe it all out. So bottom line is, whatever was before, if you think you found the fountain of youth or you found the Garden of Eden, nope. It got wiped out, seriously, I mean by the flood. So you ain't going to find it. So the seven rivers, you're not going to see them as the way they were. You're going to see them as the way they are. Because if God said something was going to exist forever, it's there forever. And so we see big rivers, you know, and we say, ah, oh, well, you know, it's got to be that one. Well, connect all the continents, get rid of the water, bring up and bring down, like bring the mountains down, then bring the valleys up, you know, and kind of make it all level plain. You might be able to figure it out. I've done some extensive research on that. I mean, really extensive. And uh, yeah, I wrote a book on it. You know, I was going to write a whole series of books on it, but it didn't catch on. People weren't that interested in what the reality of what the millennial kingdom will be like or the reality of what it was like pre-flood. I think um, if I could get a bunch of Christian people that happen to be scientists too, we could have a real good time. I mean, because um, really the world looks so different the way God created it. So all I can say to you is that when you start to look at the new series of videos, videos that are out there, they will be a little different. They're still the Jesus freak I am. You know, nothing's changed in that respect. But I have a little more understanding of the human condition. Meaning, not just the bad, but the good. Because there's no people that could be called good, but there are things that God's nature is in them. The nature of the reality of the people of the river um, living on the Mississippi in giving and caring and being compassionate towards one another I found an interesting truth about every single one of them. I mean, all of them. All of them had gone through it. Yeah, they had gone through maybe the fire, you know, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Mishael, Mishael, and whatever is their names are in Hebrew. Um, but, you know, they, they, they've been really kind of stomped on and romped on, and yet survived. Not all of them came right out and said, hey, I'm a Christian, you know. I mean, if you got to say you're a Christian, you probably are religious, but I'm not sure you're a Christian. 
You're not very Christ-like. Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm a Christian. Matter of fact, people said his followers were Jesus-like. So, you know, Christian's a nice word, you know, and I'm a Christian, yeah, sort of, you know, kind of a Christian and a believer and Jewish and, you know, and God's son, you know, so really none of those, but sort of him, you know, so all of that junk rolled into one. But we want to, in Vidivo, the internet church, bring to you, hmm, thought life, hmm, heart feelings. Oh, emotions. Because there are things out there that you can't change now. There's not going to be a great revival. Sorry. You know, I know there are people out there kind of preaching at you, you know, telling you, oh, let's pray for a great revival. Well, you keep praying. It'll be on your knees a long time. The world's coming to an end. You know, um, the Holy Spirit's pulling back. You know, there's not much going on, really, when it comes to Christendom. That is... Um, uh, well, let's just leave it at obviously a revival going on because it's not. There are people that have been saved 50 times at, you know, nice revival concert meetings, you know. Or, you know, people that are going to, you know, they already know the Bible, but now they're going to get their credentials because they're insecure. Really, I mean, that's what it boils down to when you got to go get credentials. Um, some are going for learning, but they get messed up by the learning. I mean, I've. I've heard of even some of the Bible churches that I came from being messed up. Huh. What's up with that? So, God warned us that in the latter days, people would do what they want to do. So that's what's happening right now. They're doing what they want to do. Everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. We're warned that there would be a great falling away. You know, um, the falling away isn't like something that's going to be obvious because it's just more like the falling away is like kind of what we Jesus people did. We quit being so consumed with the idea that Jesus was coming that we decided to raise our own kids, have our own families, build our own houses, have our own ministries, go on cruises. Suddenly, we were no longer the Jesus counterculture. We were the yuppie Christian culture, building Christian music empires, building Christian entertainment centers, building Christian worlds, you know, I mean, on the one hand, I get it. On the other hand, that's not how we were taught when we were saved. At least if you were from Chuck Smith's church. No, -uh. I remember. They came down from Arrowhead one time from Bible study, you know, and Chuck said, look, I see all your Porsches sitting outside, you know, um, the Bible study. And he says, you all look good, you know, with your your fancy cars, you know, and, and you know, lined up, everybody, you know, showing off to each other. Well, Pastors' conferences, they do that. You know, they kind of, how big's your church? I know, because I've heard Calvary pastors talk about it. Um, sadly, that's not bad, but it's not good. And, you know, having a mega, you know, ministry isn't really good. It might be bad in God's view, you know, because he doesn't see it the way we do. So, I would prefer that, you know, you learn some things from me about, I'm not against mega churches. I just think that you're foolish if you think that they're right on. I mean, they aren't. You, know, cause you can look at a mega church and see so much wrong with it. I mean, you, you start talking to the people and they'll start telling you all kinds of things about, you know, going on the next Christian cruise or do this, that, and the other thing. And how many Calvary chapels are there in Israel? I mean, I always like to ask that because I was in Israel, you know, I used to live there. And, uh, they go under fast. You know, there's a few now, you know, but they just can't survive and make it, can they? Or how many in Syria? I mean, don't get me wrong. There are people that we train, you know, to be there that are native to their own countries. But where are our mega churches going to except for in a mega country where there's mega money? Really? And that's why we are the rich church. We are the only one that is fulfilled in prophecy that really is the rich church. There are no other churches richer than we are. There are no other places wealthier than we are. We are the fulfillment of the one church that was, you say you are rich, but you are poor. That's us. That's us. If you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, well, you know, hey, you got a lot of good coming, you know. I mean, because God is looking at you. He wants to use you. He wants to talk to you. He might even use you while you're not saved. He does that a lot.
because he might want you to help out those that are saved because they can't seem to get it right. But then that's why we're doing this Vidivo Internet Church. Let's see, V-I-C, Vic. <laughs> Vidivo Internet Church, yeah, Vic, V-I-C. That's kind of cool, Vic. Vic, Vic's rub, <laughs> body rub, whatever for that, you know, whatever that is, you know, mental latum, I guess it is. But, um, no, we, we do Vidivo Internet Church so that we can discuss these things, not because we're going to say, why, oh, you know, you can't go to a mega church. Michael said so. No, that's not what I'm saying. You go where God tells you. You go where God leads you. I was in a mega church. I worked in a ministry of, that was at the mega church. You know, Christian tape learning library at the time, you know, and then other libraries, different times, different things, you know, along the way. But where Jesus is, is where you want to be. And where the Spirit of God has pulled away and is pulling back, you might want to look at things that maybe people like um, Ruth Graham Lott is saying. Uh, Ruth Graham Lott? I think that's her last name. Uh, warning you to pray. I'm not going to tell you to listen to some of these people, like, you know, some of these Beth, whatever, who are into, you know, like, kind of like, on the one hand, Bible studies, but on the other hand, build, you know, this big old ministerial kind of thingy, you know, or Benny Hinn or, you know, Joel Osteen, or you know, somehow get into these big jobs and make more money. Can news for you. I'm going to talk to you about the Mississippi River in a way that you might not understand. The Mississippi River is a metaphor of life. I mean, all the great rivers that God had created were metaphors for life. They were seven different venues of how we are as people. I'm going to teach you as a Mississippi River preacher in that series about you being the Mississippi River. Your tangents, your branches, your roots, your headwaters, your your pouring out your growths that are inside, your muddy river, you know, that you are. Matter of fact, it's so beautiful to see the Mississippi River being muddy because God liked that. He said, you know, somebody to get healed in that kind of water. So when you're thinking about baptisms in the ocean, you know, I mean, the ocean was kind of nice, you know, for me to get baptized in, but really God would have sent you to the Mississippi River where it's real dirty. I mean, to put it bluntly. And um, in the Old Testament, that's what he did. And the guy got healed. He didn't want to go there, but he got healed. That's what we want to talk to you about. We all have a disease. We're all impinged. We're all suffering. We're all really struggling. We're not the accomplishment and the great example of what God wanted the end of the world to be. We're limping into eternity. We're struggling to make it. There aren't a whole lot of people that are going to get raptured. No offense. That was such a false not false teaching, rapture will happen. But such a false concept to say everybody's going in the rapture. Where did you get that from? Many are called, but few are chosen. Two would be in the field, one would be taken. Man, you got so few people. I'd be nervous for my wife or me. We even tease each other a lot. Oh God, I thought you got raptured because, you know, after all, there's only two of us in the household. One of us is going, the other one's sticking her mind. Ah, oh. Well, that might be true. God is pretty interesting. If he wants you to stay, you're sticking it out. Die a martyr, but you're sticking it out. So we're going to talk about end times also in a way that you're not going to hear other people warn you about not going in the rapture. I will. I'll tell you, look, I don't care how perfect you are. If God doesn't want you to go, you ain't going. It's just like if God wants you to live, you ain't dying. You know what I mean? It wasn't my time to die on the Mississippi River, and yet I nearly died twice. I nearly got killed, you know. Um, there were a lot of challenges, a lot of interesting things that you'll find fascinating about the Mississippi River, kayaking it, because I soloed it. Um, and then when I stopped, I didn't go all the way to the Gulf. Why did I stop? Where did I stop? How come I stopped there? Well, you, what, what's up with that? You know, you failed. I, I know I like to say that because it's like most of my life until I was about 55, I used to think of myself as a failure because, you know, I, I would work in a job, you know, and then I'd move on to another job, you know, and, Looking back now, I know why, but, you know, back then I was always like, what's going on with this? What's up with that? You know, and I didn't understand what God was doing in my life, you know. So a lot of times I would talk about being a failure, you know, and, and uh, it just was a personal challenge to me until God finally set me down hard and um, spoke directly to me and talked to me about it. And I was like, oh, and I never once called myself a failure again. Not after that, not when God talks to you. And that's what I want to talk to you about. 
I'm going to present to you your father who's talking directly to you. I'm going to present to you my father as he has spoken to me. And I'm going to tell you things that, you know, you probably don't want to hear maybe in some ways, you know, but it's not about, you know, like going to church. I'm not going to tell you to go to church. I don't care if you go to church or not. I'm just going to tell you things that are blunt about God. And, you know, some people will disagree. They'll flat out say no, or they'll agree, but they'll say, I'm going too far. I'm going to just say the same things Jesus said. You could find out everything I'm going to teach on right there in Matthew, Matthew 24, or any of the other words in red in the Bible that Jesus said. I'm going to tell you things that Jesus has said that are obvious and that obviously we changed them. I mean, if, if Jesus says flat out, do this about the entire Sermon on the Mount, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, then obviously this is what he's saying. These are my sayings. Blessed are you if you do them. If you don't do them, this is what you'll be like. Your house will come crashing down. You know, you're going to be torn up, shredded, destroyed. People thought, as I started the Mississippi River and nearly died, I got rescued at the beginning, that it, I wouldn't make it. It's like, no, I went all the way to the place where I was, uh, where did I stop at? I can't think of the name of the city, but it was like, They'd all finish congratulating me on, wow, you look, we didn't think you'd make it that far. Wow, we didn't think you'd make it. Congratulations on doing it. You know, well, I hadn't gotten to New Orleans yet. So where I stopped, God said, you're done. So I stopped. It was like, did I think about what people will say? Yeah, after the fact, I kind of went, well, people are going to say you didn't finish. Well, I didn't finish their course. I finished what I set out to do. And you'll see that in the Mississippi River Preacher Series, and also in the Mississippi River um, book that's called uh, How Not to Kayak the Mississippi River. It's going to be a great book. You know, it'll be out there you know, for some version of it for the e, e version. But the point being is simple. My sheep hear my voice and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. I don't follow people's opinions or what people tell me to do. I'll listen. I'll go, really? Well, that's interesting. Does it work for you? Okay. I'll, I'll give it a shot and I'll pray and ask God. God says, no. I go, okay. And they'll tell me, well, what do you think of that? I said, well, God told me, no, you, maybe, you know, I mean, that's between you and him, but me, no, absolutely not. I'm not. It's kind of like smoking pot. I'm going to tell you straight up. There are a lot of Christians smoking pot. I mean, out there, I mean, a lot of Christians out there smoking pot because they've been convinced that somehow they can, you know, just, it's okay. And for them, it probably is, because in the Bible, there's a certain amount of grace that's been given that you can get away with a certain amount of things. But I'm going to tell you straight up, God doesn't, you know, play games when it comes to looking at your heart. If you've been conniving to smoke pot, you'll get busted. If it's in some way that somehow that, you know, it's absolutely necessary, blah, 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 which I know it's not, but you can, you know, you can convince yourself of that. Then for conscience sake, you know, as Paul wrote to the Galatians and to, you know, some of the other ones, Thessalonians and to a couple other places, that the grace of God isn't about being a legalist. No. You know what I mean? Because I can do anything I want to do. I mean, really, even murder. I get away with murder, bluntly. When I say get away with murder, I mean that being forgiven means I'm being forgiven for everything I've ever done and will do. Do I commit murder? Yeah. Sometimes if I think mad thoughts, that's murder too. So I'm not going to tell you that shooting someone is legal. I'm not going to tell you yelling at someone is legal. Both are murder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And both can be forgiven. You will pay for it in this life physically. You will be locked up into prison or you'll even suffer maybe capital punishment if they get away with, you know, doing it. Because personally, God never intended for you to have capital punishment in your hands. His hands? Yeah. Your hands? Uh-uh. But there are Christians that'll tell you, yeah, we can do capital punishment. Forget that, thou shalt not kill. That meant thou shalt not murder. How about if it means both? <laughs> God covers both. Hey, don't try to tell me about the five different tribes in Israel or whatever, so don't go there. I'll eat you. But we want to be able to inspire you. And then I want to be able to tell you bluntly, because I've been told so many bad theology things, so many bad statements, I want to tell you what the facts are, because everything that I present God my Father as exalts him to greater, being bigger and better and more wonderful and more loving and more graceful and more forgiving. I mean, that's why I say grace fully, you know, or 
holiness or mercy over grace and grace and mercy, how, why, how and why they have to go together. Um, do, is it unforgiving or unforgiving? Is it, um, I'm trying to think how people try to present hell. Is it not loving to present hell? No, it is loving because frankly, why would you want someone where you're at that's a downer? I mean, so let's be clear. If you're all full of a bunch of happy people, you know, and you got somebody that's really miserable, do you really want them around? If you're carnal and you're honest, no, you don't. And if you're spiritual and honest, no, you don't. You want them to rise to your level of happiness or joy. And frankly, that's what God can do for that person that's, you know, miserable. Well, that's the way sin and is works in heaven. You can't take sin with you in heaven. It ain't going to work. It gets consumed instantly. So a person who has sin in them, they're like a match waiting to ignite. They stand in the presence of a holy God and they're poof, suddenly they're toasties. They become a match head that just flares up and consumes the entire match and is gone. There's nothing left but ash. That's what God is like. So God says, look, I'm sending you to hell, but really I'm sparing you from the reality of you can't exist where I'm at. And that's what sin is. I mean, for us. So, you know, being filled with the Holy Spirit, there's a good reason to be filled. You don't want to singe your eyebrows, do you? Well, get filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, I mean, full, overflowing, you know, so that way, hey, if I got oil, you know, all flowing through me, you know, and it consumes the oil, then I'm not getting burned, am I? So, you know, that's a metaphor. That's an analogy. That's something that is a simile that lets you know sort of what it's like. And it's a pretty good one. You know, it works. Because the love of God is what consumes people. And God being a roaring fire or a fire, you know, consuming fire, that's love. That's not judgment. That's love that consumes. It's so pure, it eats everything else up. Literally. Or burns everything else up. So that's why God is love and the love is that fire. And it's like God has this lake of fire that's separated from, you know, himself and who he is and how he is and what he is. And Jesus said, look, there's even a gulf that, you know, because you're going to be so, you know, wanting to save people that are in hell, you know, God put a gulf there. You can't get across. Oh, wow. What a bummer. So that's why we talk about these things, because I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you, you know, to go to religious school or go to Bible school and waste your time. I want you to get to know God. God will take you where you want to go. You can learn everything in Bible school that you want to. And if he wants you there, you'll be blessed. But what if you're wasting your time? What if you're not saved and you're really wasting your time? What if you're you're kind of like, um, you know, doing your duty, you know, to drugs, sex, alcohol, and all the other goodies that you get to play with in this life? You know, like, oh, man, you know, I'm just going to cruise it till I lose it, you know, and then right at the last minute call for salvation. Do you really think that God, being as big as he is, doesn't know that? It doesn't work that way. You see, the thing I learned about the Mississippi River is that uh, God is a creator. He created the Mississippi River. While I was on the river, people died. Experienced people that know how to kayak and know how to canoe guy that was working on the river died, drowned, haven't found his body. I should have, different places, different times, died. But whether I lived or whether I died, for me, I didn't mind. You see, whether I live or whether I die, I knew I was going to be with Jesus. So I didn't, I didn't really care. To me, I would have been just as happy dying which is why I never feared some of the things I went through, even though people kept giving me warnings. Be careful of that. I'm going, you know, like I got to worry. Give me a break. But other Christians do worry about death. They, they, they cling to this life as though it were something very important. And this is, for me, this life is hell. I mean, put it bluntly, it's the closest thing to hell I'm ever going to get. Sure, I'm here for a season. God wants me to do some things for a reason. And yes, until that reason and that season is over, I'll be here. But I'm not belligerent about, you know, putting myself in jeopardy either, you know. Um, 
People kept telling me where to park my kayak so it doesn't get stolen. I parked it in obvious places. A few times it was like so wide open, everybody could see it from the river and from the shore. Nobody went and stole my kayak. You know, they didn't break into it or anything. Other times I'd be a little nervous and I'd hide it, but you know, then I'd think about it and feel guilty, you know, but God took care of it, always. I'd be bounced around, you know, on the waters, you know, in storms or in other things. And, you know, I'd be thinking, wow, you know, what if I leave Lori alone? Well, later on, I'd realize that was a pretty stupid thought, you know, because God took care of it. And that's what this is about. God taking care of it. Because God wants to take care of you. I mean, whatever it is. If you're not saved or not a Christian or whatever, if you're, you know, like into something else like Mormon or Buddha or, you know, Taoism or humanism or you think that you're an atheist. <laughs> Really? Seriously? Come on, you're not an atheist. You just don't want to get involved in religion. But, you know, I mean, if you want to play the game, I'll play the game with you. If you're an atheist, um, fine. But God will take care of it. Because whatever it is, bring it to him. He'll take care of it. He'll show you. I mean, I've had everything shown to me. I mean, I got a news for you. There's not a, I don't have a question. I can answer them all. I really can. Because I just go to God and ask him. And if he gives me the answer, I tell you. You want to challenge me on it? Please do. Send me a question. Send me anything that you think is so big that, you know, there's no answer to or God can't answer. Can God create, you know, a rock so big that he cannot live? You know, it's kind of silly you know, when you think about it. If it's a spiritual reality and you're dealing with a physical entity, well, of course he can build it that way, you know, but he's bigger than it is because he's spiritual. So it would be already beyond it because he doesn't need to pick it up. It's already existing over it and in it and through it and you know it's kind of like all those ideas about when people say well universalism is the idea that God is in everything well I can be honest with you and say well he is in a way you know so I could I could go with you on a certain portion of what you understand but I can take you one step farther and that's what video church is about I can take you one step closer to where you can now go on with God. You can go on with learning about him. You can go on and discover God. You can ask me questions about anybody, you know, or anything, you know, and I'll be straight up. I'm not going to lie to you. It's like, well, what about this guy? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, eh, you know, he does this and he does that and he came from this and he came from that, but he's going this way and this is what he, you know, I mean, bottom line. So I'm here not for you, but I'm here because God put me here and I can respond to those things that challenge people in their lives because I'll bring God to it and God will show you. God will speak to you. God will answer the questions you have in your heart. And I don't mean you have to make up some spiritual question. It could be just stupid questions. I mean like, well, did Adam have a navel? <laughs> Think about that. I always throw that out there. People just, it's funny. People will forget the entire thing. <laughs> Excuse me. People will forget this entire video. They'll remember that question. Did God have, did, did Adam have a navel? Hmm. Did Eve? <laughs> when you get to heaven, go look for navels. <laughs> navel, navel, navel. <laughs> there are going to be navels in heaven. <laughs> oh, boy. But the point is, you know, you get, I hope you get it, you know. So, video will always still be, you know, um, the word of God by the Spirit of God, to the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus. it will always be, you know, the Spirit of God leading and guiding. And because, you know, that measure of Spirit that I've been given, yeah, it's diminished, but still there, still flowing out, still like an artesian well. But there are people that are using theirs for wrong purposes and will probably dry up soon. And you'll see that things are beginning to make no sense at all. You know, elections don't make any sense. You know, football season probably won't. <laughs> they're going to be keep, you know, doing whatever they're doing. Um, you know, different things in your life won't make any sense. Call me. Talk to me. Be a part of Vidivo Internet Church. Because that's what it is. You don't have to, you know, sign up or send money. I don't take money. If you sent me money, I'd send it back. We don't, we 40 years now, I've never taken a cent. Thank God. Because then I can make that claim. But um, God provided. God provided. God provided for me on the Mississippi River. God provided here. God provides always. And so, Closing this out, I'd have to say, 
if you want to go through changes, if you want to get older and live a long time, you know, I've been around for, you know, quite a while, I long enough to grow a beard. Um, but, you know, if you want to have a better life, a more abundant life, a, a life that is compressed, I'll admit, but comprised of those things that Jesus said were peaceful, that were loving, that were joy-filled. Come along for the ride. You'll never be bored. I'm not someone who comes off with just, you know, the same old blase stuff. I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about abortion, you know, or castration of men, you know, for abortion's sake, you know, or all the issues of social, you know, occasions that this is what it should be, or this is the way it ought to be. This is what God would do, you know, and things like that. And you'll, you'll kind of go, mm -hmm. but that's the bottom line. I determined early on in my faithful life to always want to know the answer. And God always gave it to me. I mean, I hear, don't get me wrong. I hear some very famous people make some very bold statements about some things. And I would say, nope, that's not the truth. That's not, that's not what God does. That's not how God works. MacArthur, you know, I've heard him blow it. You know, I mean, I've heard everybody do it at one point in time. You know, And I've blown it. Believe me, when I blew it, I was pissed. <laughs> it was a Jewish thing, but, you know, I mean, I mean, without, it was my blowing it, but. I was mad, man. I was really, well, two things. One was the Jesus Freak thing about, you know, um, evangelism and that idea of Jesus standing at the door of our heart, you know, on, knocking on the outside. He ain't talking to non-Christians. He's talking to Christians. So, you know, I was told he was non-Christian, so I was mad about that and argued with God about it. Mad at pastors, teachers, and ministers, and, you know, on and on. Um, because I said I was deceived, you know, and then also, you know, a Jewish question was the Jewish question was about legalism and about grace, you know, so it was like, it was, it was a pretty good question. You know, I mean, my theological premise was interesting in the sense of it's still predicated and it's accurate. Only I have to be very careful about the way that it's presented because the way I thought of it before was, you know, I could see how it was deviant, you know, in some ways, you know, how it could be deviated into something that was not grace based, you know. So yeah, you know, so I was like, yeah, you know, but I was still arguing about it for years, you know, thinking about it, working it out with God, you know. And that's what I've done. I never accepted status quo or things that I know were wrong. I wanted God to reveal the truth. So I know the truth. But just like that movie, you can't handle the truth. Now I'm not gonna say standing on the wall protecting you, but like, you know, that movie that that quote came from, but the fact of the reality of the truth is Jesus. The summation of the reality of all that is true is Jesus. So when Jesus says, do this, he means it. The Beatitudes are action oriented. They aren't just simply something that's, oh, that's nice. If you're poor, you got it. You know, if you're not, well, yeah, so. You know. No, you can't judge. You don't get to judge, period. You don't get to hate. You don't get to kill. You don't get to not turn the other G. You do. You get to be a doormat. And you think you're not going to be a doormat? Yeah, you will. You will. You will. You will. You will. Now, God will do his part. Somebody steps on you. Watch when God steps on them because he keeps the accurate scales. Stepped on you, God steps on. You'll be praying for that person because you'll say, don't hit me, stupid. You hit me, and guess what God's going to do? He'll hit you. Yeah. I've seen lots of things that you don't want to know about when it comes to God doing his part. So, to close this out, let me present to you an uh, offering, you know, to, for you to do your part. Check it out. Check out God. Check out, you know, me. Check out my webpage or whatever, you know, or video or whatever. Check it all out, you know. Prove it and then follow along. I don't want you to get sidetracked or distracted by these end times because it's going to happen. A lot of people are going to be deceived and misled and, you know, they won't be ready for the end of the world at all. Preppers aren't prepped, you know, um, uh, whatever the other guys are that are doing the end of the world stuff, you know. Uh, the Mormons think that, you know, if, if you save seven years of food, you know, it'll be fine. You know, well, no, if God curses the waters, the water that's in your canteen will turn red or blood, you know, so don't think that, you know, you can just, you know, sleaze into, you know, the tribulation period, 
slide through, you know, seven years of, you know, like everything, all hell breaking loose and then somehow make it into the millennial kingdom or that that's all made up or that's already happened. I'll prove to you you're wrong. Man, no doubt about it. If you don't think there's a rapture, I can prove to you there is. No problem. You may not be prepared for it because maybe you aren't going in it. You know, God doesn't want you prepared. He wants you prepared to get into tribulation period and die. Bottom line is, you know, God warns some kings to. Get your house in order. You're dying, dude. Well, some of you will die soon. Maybe today. And I'm not talking about that for salvation. I don't care if you get saved. But I'm just telling you, reality of, you know, of, uh, Driving down the freeway, you know, and it's pretty nasty out there, you know. I mean, I, I'm a Southern California driver, so guess what? Watch out. But no, I mean, death is here. Death is reality. Death is part of our life. But we don't die physically and end. We die physically and spiritually continue. Ooh. That's what you got to deal with. Where will you go with your soul? And what will you do with your spirit when the body is gone? And your options are no longer there. Get saved. Figure it out. Work it out. Deal with it. You know, go on with it. And that's all I'm going to say about that. You know, it's like, I'm not going to give these, like, you know, altar calls. Like, <laughs> An altar call is made up in modern days based upon the idea that somehow if we wiggle you enough, if we tickle you enough, if we hold you like a string over, you know, a roaring fire and warn you enough, then, you know, you're going to come running forward and get saved, you know, and just make that declaration, you know, and profess with your mouth, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God, Father. And then you're going to confess in front of 10,000 people, you know, and uh, because you admitted me before man, I'll admit you before God because you did this religious trip. <laughs> I'm really wondering if God's honoring any of those. You know, <laughs> I'd be nervous about those because if you read the history of it, I understand Billy Graham Association and BGEA and all these you know ways of getting saved, but when Jesus walks up to a disciple and says, "Follow me," or somebody else says, "Well, what, what do I need to be saved?" He says, "You know, just confess your mouth." I go, "Well, okay, God." You know. I mean. I'm more with Raul Reese sitting there watching TV with Chuck Smith, you know, get saved than I am people running forward at a concert with the mass hysteria of the emotions going on. And we saw one of the greatest live legendary rock concerts of Christianity and we got all hyped and then we went forward and got saved. Well, that's nice. Big net, you know, fishermen throwing out the net, you know, pulling them all in. Then they're like, and this is what, you know, they'll tell you when they're doing these great crusades. Well, it's a big net. You throw the net out. You pull everybody in. And, you know, some of them will be like good seed. Some of them will be bad seed. Some of them will have roots. Some of them won't. Some of them will perish along the way. But you still throw the big net out. And you be a big trawler and you bring it all in. Have you ever been a board of fish with a fisherman? Have you ever been on board with, you know, somebody that's skilled at fishing? You know, that's got the hook, line, and sinker, you know. Or a fly fisherman. They know what they're doing. They aren't just taking some big giant net and dragging it, and pulling everything else in with it, are they? Now, there's a scripture that talks about, you know, a big net. You might want to look a little closer at that one, too. So... To end this now, because I've been talking for a while, I'm back from the Mississippi River, um, recovering. I'm physically depleted. I'm way underweight, um, spiritually blessed, emotionally challenged in a lot of ways, um, dealing with some things, you know, like we all are, but you know, dealing with some things that are... Um, taking time because of how physically um, draining it was. Oh, I'm emotionally drained because I met hundreds of people that I, I interviewed, you know, about their life on the river. And that's going to be in the book. And so until I start writing the book, which is starting a couple more days, you know, I need three days at least to recover. Um, but when I start writing the book, you know, and researching, 
gradually all this stuff that I've taken in, you know, will come out. I didn't, I didn't do a lot of talking. Though some people would have said I talked a lot. I did a lot of talking to people and letting them talk. And boy, did I hear life stories that just... I uh, I felt like God the Father looking down and on his people and just weeping. You know, I'm just like, they don't get it. I don't understand. I mean, not that these people were bad or anything. I mean, these people were wonderful people. I mean, I met everyone... 100% on the Mississippi River, I met people that all represent the loving kindness of God, really, because the, the reason why they were able to do what they do, meaning caring and sharing from their food or their arbor or their their um, time or effort with me and being river people, you know, giving, giving, being giving people, um, it, it's because of God, isn't it? I mean, at some point in time, that's what boils it down to, you know, um, the sins of the father visit the generations of uh, the children to the third and fourth generation. Well, at the same time, sometimes the blessings go on with that, too. You know, if there was a very religious, you know, start, it'll go for a couple generations. You know, there'll be an influence. It doesn't mean they'll all get saved, but if there's an influence. And so the people on the river, they're influenced. All right, boy, Minnesotans are fascinating to me. But all the way down the river, it was just amazing. You know what I mean? So that's why. It'll take a lot to get that out, you know, but at the same time, part of the healing process, part of the restoration of old things and new things and revival or reviving that with which, you know, was ready to perish the feeble knees, you know, strengthen the feeble knees, um, remind fathers to be fathers to their children and all that kind of stuff, you know, from the end times, you know, if you did know that you're supposed to be doing that. Oh, you don't know that. Well, go look at the prophets. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, you want to quote, call or send me a, Email, you know, through this venue, whichever one, and I'll respond. I'll tell you where it's at in the Bible, you know, scriptures, and you know, more than one. Um, and you know, you can probably ignore me after that because that's what most people do. They don't like to be told the truth, the facts, you know, of the scriptures. Um, but it's without. Hardship for me to say that. Better that I start this now and be long-winded and, and get video going than to leave you ways and means of what I'm seeing just by today on the internet. You know, things that some of you are saying even or doing. You're saying, wow, ouch, you know, that must hurt. So I'm here, you know, I'm praying for you. I'm praying a blessing on you. And I think we want to go that direction with Vidigo Internet Church. We want to bless you. We don't want your money. We don't want your time or effort or energy or anything else. We want to bless you. We want to bless you in the, the, the you okay. Heavenly Father, I pray that these people that are watching right now, whether they know you or not, that they're blessed anyways. I don't care. You know, I, I really don't care, God. But you bless them today because it's your day. This is the day that you have made. So you created it in such a way that you can bless them. Bless them with sunshine. Bless them with encouragement. Bless them with a understanding better of whatever little part they understand. Increase it a little bit. And then bring them to the place slowly but surely each day of understanding your way and your will. And your doing in their life what a father would do as he loves his children. So God... I do pray that you would bless them with that blessing that you've given to Aaron to bless the people of Israel. That blessing that you said that we could each and every one of us as children of the Most High God, that each and every one of us that as being sons and daughters of God, that we would learn to bless even the ungodly. So I pray a blessing upon those that are godly, that they would turn their eyes from themselves and getting to giving, even as the people of the river were so giving that I was blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. And, you know, you don't have to say in Jesus' name, by the way, and all that other stuff, because we'll talk about that later. But there'll be things that, you know, we'll be doing on a teaching basis also, you know, through the preaching. But I just wanted to remind you and to say that about the video church, in video internet church, as we change the name over in some of the web pages and sites and all the other and blogs and all that. I got so much stuff on the internet, you know, um, 10,000 videos. And it's like, are you kidding me? Really? I saw six and then it went up to ten. I'm like, oh boy. Um, but 
I think that Ruth Graham Lott is right on. I really do. I think the blessing went from Billy Graham to her. You know, skip Frank. You know, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, Frank reminds me of Aaron. Frank just, I mean, if you think Aaron is wonderful, okay, you know, but I'd rather follow Moses. But, um, yeah, I, I think Franklin Graham is just Aaron. But I think Ruth Graham Lott is um, anointed and appointed by God for this particular time in, in life, you know. Um, and men and women should listen to her. You know? I think that there are some people that just really, you know, I don't, uh, I think Joyce Meyer, Joyce Meyer is a great speaker, you know. I, I have posted and pasted and put, you know, a lot of her materials up on the web. I don't think she's fit for the times. I don't think she understands the end of the world. You know? But her ministry, I think, is right on. You know, same thing with a lot of other people that are involved in, you know, supporting some of those things. I think you're kind of like um, covering up what we should be like, maybe not worried, but getting ready for. And, you know, if anything, we should be the Jesus freaks that we're saying. Jesus is coming soon, sooner than you think, very soon, you know, right around the door, right around, right, right around the corner. Between 2017 and 2022, you don't have much time left, you know, if you have any at all. Um, those are the windows of opportunity for the massive percentages of the pre-tribulation, if you want to call it that, uh, pre-wrath, pre-tribulation, whatever, um, rapture of the church, where literally some believers, not all, not 100%, some people are taken in a snatching away where God says, I'm not leaving you there, you know, or you're praying, God, don't leave me here. I mean, Paul said, pray that you be counted worthy, um, but Jesus said it too. And so, you, you know, you, you got to know that it's going to happen. Then you got to pray that it don't happen to you. I mean, my ambivalence about that is simply that I'm not strong on this one area about the rapture, and that's with the Jewish people. I don't know if the Jewish people are going to be raptured. You know, I know messianics are kind of, you know, weird on a lot of things. You know, some things they got right, Jesus' birth, you know, <laughs> it's not Christmas. You know, they pretty much have figured it out when it is. You know, it's like, okay, I could go with that. But, um. You know, Jewish people, we might not be uh, Jew. Hey, such a deal. Uh, we might not go into rapture. We might be stuck about, you know, stuck around. You know, God just seems to choose who he uses, you know. And he might not rapture people. I mean, I know there's neither Jew nor Gentile barbarians, just they're free, you know, and the grace of God and the mercy. And God has made all different people to become Jews of the heart and, you know, all the other stuff, blah, 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 blah. Don't go with the two branches. I'll beat you to death with both of them. But, you know, I mean, you know, that, that's the point is, you know, um, it's possible. It's possible maybe Jews don't get raptured. But other than that, yeah, there's a rapture. So pray you be counted worthy. The few that are will, you know, I always think that it won't be somebody in the church. It'll be people outside the church, you know, that are like street people more than likely, but I'm just kidding. But that's, you know, happening. And so we should be taking serious thought on how we should live in these latter days. How then ought you to live? Don't go telling your grandchildren, you know, and setting up, you know, uh, schooling and teaching accounts bull loaning ain't gonna happen dude i mean man put your money where your mouth is if you really believe jesus is coming act like it with everything you got and that's why i'm back i'm worried that people are like playing the safe game well we gotta hedge our bets we might be wrong about this rapture thing you know no you don't no you don't no you know billy graham had the guts to step out and when he was like sick he said, look, God promised me that I'm not going to die until I do this. You know, sure enough, he didn't die. And he did it. I was like, that's guts. You know, have faith. So closing this in reality is, I don't just pray the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace is disappearing from the world. I mean, obviously, the violent man is becoming more violent. And if you're into violence, you need to get rid of your guns and your violence and throw it away. Get it as far away from you as you can. You're not taking violence into heaven. And if you're violent, you're going into Begitto and going to play with Armageddon. I mean, really, that's where the violent man is going. All violence will be taken to that valley and it will be stomped on and romped on and gone. The spirit of it, as well as the physical people that are violent. So no offense, don't be an MMA Christian fighter. Don't be a, you know, like Christian boxer. Get out of violence. Work it out. Um, take the time to figure out the reality of 
what a Christian really is. I mean, they're not into, well, we just put the stamp Christian on top of our vocation. It's not the way it works. You know, you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus. So, hey, be a Jesus freak, you know, be a Jesus gypsy. Don't follow me as I follow Jesus, but you know, hey, you know, you learn from me. You, know, you might pick up from my mistakes. You might pick up from my, my truths. You might pick up from the reality of me talking to Jesus. And uh, you might talk to him too. Wouldn't that be something awesome? I'll bet that if you did right now speak to Jesus, he would speak to you.